Okay, well, thank you all for um, your rich conversations earlier today. I think we wanna maybe continue the uh, agenda item number nine discussion. And um, I guess I'd like to really encourage those of you who you know, have um, maybe been just sort of trying to get acclimated as you know, this being your first meeting, I want to encourage you also um, to, to talk. Um, I think it would be very helpful for Jen and James and the other you know, coordinating board staff to kind of hear how people are looking at you know, funding students on their campuses from the different you know, areas that we talked about. So I welcome uh, more uh, input, more discussions. For, for our um, PhD programs, um, it's all based on the grants that the faculty have and the, the positions they have available within their labs and then their projects. Um, but for our medical students and our uh, dental students and so forth, that's all done through loans. Can I ask you a question? You said for your PhD students, it mainly comes from the grants. Um, is there an initial support from the institution for the first year or two, and then the PI takes over, or how, how does it work? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I'll have to check with you, and I think it depends on the department, on how they do it, and the level of grants that they have and, and faculty working on them. But I can get back with you on that. At UT Arlington, okay. we have a similar model. Um, we guarantee support for PhD students for their first three years. Okay? After that, they're expected to be put on grant support if they're in a STEM discipline. We'll extend probably two years more for people in non-STEM disciplines. And the reason for that is there's less grant opportunity out there that provides student support outside of STEM. So we've tried to be case sensitive <coughs> to that. Um, so that's the model we're working with. We also don't typically support master students in any of our disciplines. There's a few, um, but the rule of thumb is that if you're a master student, probably principally because you're in a professional master program, most of our master programs are professional, and they're time limited, they're very lockstep. Right? The decision was made to move money into the PhD in a way out of the master students because it's more possible for them to self-fund than it is for a PhD. At UNT, we also provide a tuition supplement for students who are employed as GAs, graduate assistants, TAs, and that kind of thing. And typically, they will register for nine hours, we'll provide a supplement for six hours. But it's administered through the departments because it's tied to the employment is so we allocate so much to the department and they decide and so they can give a student nine hours credit to that is to cover everything or they can give six hours so they have the flexibility there and at our institution that kind of governs how many students they can accept into the program at ut arlington yeah give me if i get my terminology wrong here there are two forms of tuition we collect, statutory and designated. We waive designated, okay, which is about 80% of a doctoral student's tuition bill. Okay. So that's as close as we can come to giving a student a ride. It's a very expensive proposition and very difficult for us to do. I'll add that. Can I ask something a little different from this, not just the tuition part of it. When we have grad students, their PhD programs, if they have to travel to meetings and register for meetings and everything, how are they being supported at the other universities? At UT Arlington, it's a mix. Uh, departments provide some of that support out of the budget, budgeted items. Uh, the graduate office provides support. Uh, we try to match department money when we can. So if the department will pay half, we'll pay the other half if, if that's w within limits. Um, we went for, for a, lo the lo a long period of time because we were interested in building up strength in our graduate student organization. We actually bankrolled them to become a travel agent for graduate students okay, and expected that they would use that as a way of recruiting students to participate in their organization 
that had mixed results, and so we're revisiting that at the moment. But there are various sources out both within the department and outside of the department that we are using to support the travel needs of our students. At UNT, um, through a pool created from the VP for Research, VP for Finance, um, President's Office, which, which comes to the graduate school, uh, we provide up to $500 a year for, a stu for each student, and it's from both masters and uh, doc students. But they have to have it a, a 50, the equivalent match from the department. And so the departments have some funds, and my argument is that the department demonstrates that this conference or this activity is sufficiently important to us. So if they get a $500 match from the department, they can get up to $500 from the grad school. Um, and that's for all grad students. The challenge we've had this particular time, we have a three, uh, three, we fund it three times. We have three deadlines, and so a student can apply any three times. The challenge we've had is non degree seeking students, because I have used this travel grant mechanism as a way to get students to do what we want them to do get your degree plan on file, making timely progress, and that kind of thing. So you won't get a travel grant if you don't have a degree plan on file. You won't get a travel grant if you have not attended three grad workshops, professional development workshops, all that. Um, but the challenge has been those students who are non-degree seeking. If they want to attend a conference, do you have funding? So we're working through that to see, can we create another part to match, to provide that match for them? Mark. I was gonna add, just at Texas Tech, um, we take we have three tuition categories: graduate tuition, designated tuition, and state tuition. So we uh, typically uh, waive the graduate tuition, the designated tuition, and the president's office provides a scholarship for the state tuition for all PhD students. For travel, we have the same type of program you mentioned at UNT. We uh, we have a pot. Uh, I'll provide up to five hundred dollars uh, for every graduate student who travels, who is presenting. Yes. They have to be in a degree granting program, and they have to be enrolled for a certain number of credits. Um, and typically, every student who asks gets it. The other program that I was, we were talking about at lunch, um, in the in, in students who are doing research, like they need to use the clean room. Typically, they come in with a faculty member's grant, and then the grant runs out. And so the student still has to do the research. And so we've created a small fund in the grad school. The student can apply for that. That provides them a little 500 to $1,000 that they can apply specifically to support the research. And the other students are coming in and saying, well, I'm going to collect data. Uh, I need to buy data. I need to be in Paris specifically for this project. So that is open to them also. So they can apply for $500 to $1,000. And it's a small part. So when it's gone, it's gone. But th we, we have that for them. We have a similar competition, research support fellowships, we call them. They're competitive, so we can't fund everybody, but student PhD students can apply for up to $5,000, and master's students for up to $2,000 of support for, for research uh, expenses. But they have to be really related to the um, um, research expense. So it's not to go to a conference and present the research, but it's to collect data to buying supplies, et cetera, and we either pay it directly to the student or if they need to purchase things that are not available on the free market, then they get a university account through a faculty member. But that's been quite successful, and we've had um, a good number of master's students um, also um, sign up, and we are now tracking, um, we now have had this for a number of years, and we're now tracking um, completion rates to see if it makes a difference. So have you uh, measured the outcome after these kind of investments? Since you've invested $5,000 per PhD student or something, what you have gotten out of it? Well, as I was saying, we are, we are now tracking to see if they're um, producing the research, um, uh, if they're graduating um, 
um, more quickly, but we see in a lot of, uh, and we do not fund necessarily, I mean, if a f we appeal to the faculty members, if the faculty member has a grant that can cover the expense that they, and it's already written in their grant that they please not apply to ours, but it has helped those students in disciplines where there isn't funding readily available to actually conduct the research. And we've heard uh, from a number of students and from faculty members, had it not been for this money, the project would have had to take a different um, shape where they would have had to do other other things um, at Texas Tech we do have something similar for um, for especially for students in humanities social sciences and and arts fields um, we've been able to uh, leverage resources that are provided every year from uh, our parent family uh, groups uh, the grad student has fund grad student organization has a fundraising activity and then we approach um, a couple different local foundations that provide matching funds so we provide again up to five thousand dollars although typically it's more like two thousand dollars to support research that's not otherwise been able to be supported we do track the outcome in terms of publications and so on. And the other thing we do, um, when I first arrived, we were giving all kinds of money away and we weren't getting anything out of it. So um, that's the only stick I have to, to use with the carrot is everyone who gets any money from me at all, they have, to, they have to participate in at least three professional career development events during the year and write an external fellowship application. We have a similar program at UTA. Um, we call it a dissertation enhancement program. Uh, it really is a research funding program. It also includes travel money if you wish to go study at the feet of some, you know, you know guru uh, uh, to enhance what you know and or your skill sets. It's really very, it's very broadly conceived. We've tracked this program, it's about four years old now, and our completion rates are very near to 100%. So it's money well spent. Okay, I think that's it. Um, actually, there's a couple of other points I'd, li I'd like to hear about first, if you don't mind. Um, one of them is, so we've heard, uh, I've, this has been really helpful. You provide a lot of information about kind of your general approaches and general strategies, masters and doctoral students, travel, but what about specific populations of students? Do you have, and how do you use monies intended to say, attract a particular demographic? Underrepresented students. You know, if you're if you've got a successful nur nursing program, do you do you use any kind of financial incentives to try to get more men in there? If you have an engineering program, do you use financial incentives to try to get more women in there? Uh, what about ethnic breakdowns or domestic students? Do you do you use targeted funds towards certain demographics? And if so, how do you do that? We do. Uh, at Sam Houston State, we have uh, we sponsor two programs. One is called Aspire which is for minority and underrepresented uh, master's level scholars. It comes with some scholarship support. We uh, set up a structured mentor relationship for the student and we give them some other material aid with their books and eventually their graduation regalia and things like that. And we've also recently inaugurated Road to PhD. Currently we're sponsoring 10 doctoral students, minority and under underrepresented groups and uh, some of them matriculated out of Aspire and some of them came to the university in direct response to recruitment for Road. Uh, and it's a similar kind of thing. And uh, we are finding, uh, this is very new, it's only a couple of years into it, we're finding though that we had a very high attrition rate of minority students who came and felt quite alienated on our campus. And now th these particular groups of students are report a completely different experience and they're speaking out to other minority students in their programs who may not be formal participants, but we're building community and, uh, and recruiting relationships at institutions around Texas that way. And Ken, do you organize and run this out of your graduate yeah, school? That's out of the graduate school on my, on my money, yeah. So uh, being in the uh, border city of El Paso, majority of our master's students, more than 60 70 percent of them are minorities, Hispanics. And what we are doing right now is, uh, knock on wood, we have the luxury of giving them a scholarship to attract these students because they come from a very economically 
what do you call, underserved or uh, not the right terminology, but so they are the first generation college uh, goers actually, and their parents are usually, you know, working in different uh, very small jobs like custodial jobs and everything the first time. So if we don't support them with these kind of scholarships, what I did was I was just looking at some of the data that was available. There's a lot of attrition, as he had mentioned. People drop out because they're not able to support themselves. So this scholarship has actually kept these students at school until graduation. That has helped us tremendously doing that. We have a, a fellowship program um, that you know focuses on, um, I guess, uh, diversity, and um, you know it uh, has a lot of different dimensions to it. And so you know the uh, nominators have to sort of talk about how then you know the student brings diversity to the program and to the university. And so in certain cases it might be you know female. Sometimes it's about the research that they're focusing on. Sometimes it's about racial, ethnic diversity. Um, so we have a master's level and a doctoral level. And um, for the fellowship, just kind of based on sort of some data from, you know, a few decades ago, we actually, we give a stipend part that's like a fellowship part, but we also require at least a 25% assistantship from the department so that the students get connected to the department also. We do the same thing at Texas Tech. We have a diversity fellowship program. So we waive the application fee. We have a fellowship. They have to be connected to a department, so it requires at least a 0.25% appointment in the department. They're also part of a mentor group uh, that we have. And then I provide a $2,000 research travel allowance to them as well. And Mark, you're, you're running that out of your graduate school? Out of the grad school. It comes out of one of my endowments. Okay. If I could. It's for both masters and doctoral students. Right. Well, one other uh, issue I'd like to raise is we've heard some a little bit here about um, competitiveness uh, in and out of state. In particular, I'm interested in hearing about how you feel that your programs and, and it's particularly your support for students in your programs uh, compares not just to, uh, your peer institutions around the state but around the country. Uh, I have heard in the past, and I know other staff have heard in the past, that the issue of tuition waiver, which waivers, which has already been discussed here a little bit, is a factor. Um, I'd like to drill down into that a little bit more, if, if you don't mind. How much of a factor is it? Uh, how much, how much do you, of a competitive edge do you feel is lost by, by your inability to waive that statutory portion of graduate tuition? as compared to other states or, or private institutions that can do as they like? Andrew, this is a, is, is a, is a major issue for you, uh, and it's certainly one for us at the master's level. Most of our doctoral students are supported by one, you know, one means or another. The issue for us is, is quite frankly, health insurance, which is connected to this. And I know for my colleagues at UT and A&M, this is not quite the issue for this for, for the rest of us, but um, what typically happens is if they're in a 0.5 FT appointment as a TA or an RA, they have the same health insurance that, that we do, but um, they have to pay the other 50%. Uh, which is more expensive, so they typically opt out of that plan, which leaves money on the table. So when you talk to your legislators, oh, well, you guys aren't using all the money we're giving you. Well, then they, then the students have to go buy the student health plan, and it's killing us at the international level because the, the required uh, insurance for student health insurance or the repatriation and so on is, is just, it's just killing us. We need some flexibility with how to use those state dollars to pay for health insurance. So for us, um, I guess the way that I would say, you know, kind of not waiving, you know, the tuition 
could impact something is. So uh, for the students that are on assistantships, if, you know, they are funded with state dollars, then we have a pool from the university that pays for the tuition. And so I guess if we didn't have to pay for the tuition, we potentially could have money to pay higher stipends. Um, you know, for the students, um, and um, and ones where they're externally funded in the faculty, of course, then through their grants have to have resources to cover it. So that means, of course, and whenever we increase tuition, you know that you're increasing the burden on those faculty who are bringing in the money, and then also on your central pool. And um, and so I think one thing you worry is that the students become as expensive as postdocs, and you know faculty want to utilize postdocs more or something, so. Actually, I got a question for you, Karen and Dean, too, this probably applies to, but, or anybody else. Do you, when you charge a tuition to a grant, do you pass any of that tuition revenue back down to the generating unit or the PI? It all stays. We're trying to figure out ways to incentivize faculty to write grants with students on them. And so we're thinking of some sort of business model that would do that. Well, one of the things that we have is, so uh, at some point uh, we started uh, having, you know, these fees in addition kind of to tuition. And there was a point where those fees increased, you know, and so maybe, you know, student fees could be, say, 50% of what the total tuition is. And so currently in our model, we require the payment of tuition, either from, you know, the external dollars or from, you know, the internal pool, but we don't require it for fees. And so we are now looking at, you know, how do we cover that? So how do we get a pool large enough from, for our state-funded ones, which... I think it might be four or five million dollars, and then also the faculty would have to add that expense. And so we are thinking in that model, maybe one option could be that we kind of help cover that cost for the faculty um, for that increase. But again, we got to find the pool to come to cover that. Um, at uh, UTSA, we're going to be switching to a hybrid RCM model next year, effective next year. So our budget model is going to change. So the revenue that's generated in the college is going to be split between the college and some sort of a strategic initiatives pool. So tuition and fees, as well as other revenue, uh, is going to be split based on that. So we think it's going to encourage uh, at the college level to put those things so that they can come back to the college to be more entrepreneurial. So. Jim, going back to your original question about how much of a hurdle this um, lack of tuition waiver is, is a problem, we know that we don't ha at least I don't have hard data. And I think that if we went back to look at the hard data, we'll be able to find that. But in my department in geography, you <clears throat> offer, you know, positions to maybe about 10 students, only three show up because they got better offers somewhere else. And you hear that repeatedly across the university. But I don't, I don't know that we have actually sat down to compile the data on how many students were offered but went to some other place outside of Texas because our, you know, our offers are not competitive enough. Right, and, and e when the students do go somewhere else, they, they don't come back to you and say, and the reason I went somewhere else is because of something you did, right? They, they don't tell you that, so it's, usually it's a black box there, right? You don't know what... what we try to ask, and some are kind enough to provide an answer, however brief, terse it might be. <laughs> yeah. You try to fill in your gaps of knowledge with a, a, a survey. We have, we have in the, yes, if, they, if actually somebody tells us that they're not coming and not all students do, then we do ask why. Our Texas mm -hmm. Academy of uh, Martins, so our TEM students especially, yeah, they're snatched up by the big universities, Stanford and other universities, and we can't compete. We, we do the same thing. We, we encourage it to be done at the program level, and when we have communications from students declining or, or otherwise saying they're not coming, we ask them why, and anecdotally, the number one reason is that they got a better offer. Yeah, we, we've had the same thing. Our students um, will be going back and forth with the department or the faculty, and they'll say, I was offered, you know, tuition here, 
can do you have that and we have to say well no but um and and we have been hearing at an increasing level that that has been factoring into uh decisions and i know specifically that in the mcnair program that's one of the things they teach the graduates the students go to the institution that provides you the best package. And they talk about package in terms of total, the faculty support, but also the living. You should not be, if you're smart enough to go to grad school, you're smart enough to get somebody else to pay for it. So go somewhere where they will pay for it. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, so our next topic is about um, micro-credential characteristics, definitions, and considerations. And so I think um, uh, some of the questions are related to maybe how you're defining this, um, perhaps, you know, um, some differences in context and disciplines or in certain degrees. Uh, and um, I don't know, I think probably also want some input on, you know, sort of hearing the coordinating board uh, perspective about that and some policy implications. So I don't know if you want to start maybe with that and then let others give some. Sure. Um, you know, here we're, th excuse me. Um, <coughs> excuse me, just anecdotally, it seems like there's a rise in these uh, small credentials uh, small certificates, micro-credentials, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and we're interested in hearing why these seem to be becoming more popular, uh, what, what kind of specific uses do they have. Uh, in terms of discipline, are there particular disciplines where this is a trend? Um, and where, do, do, you see, uh, do you see any, any trend line? Do you think we're headed in a particular direction? Uh, I would just point out that the uh, our, our rule thresholds are you know 15 hours at the graduate level. So below that that threshold, below 15 hours, they're considered institutional certificates, and you can formulate them and offer them at your own discretion. So how many? Uh, first, maybe just kind of a definition. What what are these? Like how many courses or hours do they typically consist of? Is is there any consistency? We have them primarily in our professional programs, and I would say dentistry is probably the biggest user of those. Um, and it depends on what specialty they're going into after they get their um, DDS degree. Um, some of those disciplines only require about four semester credit hours to get credentialed, and I think it's general family practice dentistry or something like that, whereas um, oral maxillofacial surgery takes seven years. You know, so it just depends, I think, on, on that particular field, that the specialty that they're going into. Let's see, James, if you can help me understand institutional certificates and all of that, maybe I have two of these within my department. One is a uh, four, credit, four course, 12 credit, a master's in bank management. Another one happens to be a four course, 12 credit, um, a certificate in taxation. I was thinking that's what you're thinking about, and why didn't why didn't we go to 15? It's easier to do the 12, you know, and we can create it. Um, also, I don't have the faculty to create a full blown program, and it can be easily placed within our MBA program within the 30 credits of the MBA program. And, and are students uh, drawn to these uh, small certificates, these micro-credentials? Do you find that they're popular? Oh, yes, yeah. really. Well, we, again, we have just, we've doubled our MBA. And so we need something to have them do. So we're, we're sort of having programs being created to try to catch up to the growth that we're seeing in our online MBA. Um, and so they're popular. It gives them something to separate them from the plain vanilla. MBA program. Uh, 
um, our graduate faculty governance body has spent about the last year <coughs> struggling, fighting, arguing about credentials. Um, a lot of what has come up relates to credentialing non-degree seeking students. Um, I, my own personal opinion is I see this as a very complex issue in terms of wondering then what the value of a degree is and admission standards for non-degree seeking versus degree seeking students. Um, our general, we have not yet adopted these policies, but probably will shortly, um, has defined that a credential can be anywhere from, I believe, nine hours to 29. Um, that non-degree seeking, you, students can be admitted into a non-degree seeking uh, categorization to seek these credentials. Um, for our current degree seekers, we've done certificates for a long time, a few. We don't have a whole, well, we've got a fair number. In, in a lot of ways, I don't see it as any particular big deal. It's a transcript not not notation on, our on UT Austin transcript. If they're a degree seeker, it's just saying, well, they, they took this sort of collection of related coursework. For the non-degree seekers, presumably it is the terminal event. Um, it means because they were a non-degree seeker, the fact that they never achieved a degree doesn't show up in the failed to complete lists. Um, the next debate will be, can you stack those and ask for a degree? Um, there's, I think that the, that's <coughs> liable to be what the faculty ask for. Um, I'm still concerned about how many hours you can take as a non-degree seeker, then go back and ask to stack those to get a degree. Because then I'm wondering what the difference is and how many of our degree seeking applicants did we turn <coughs> down because we didn't have space for them while taking non-degree seekers that in some cases occupy the same seats. Now, in some programs, they will not. It's a sort of separately funded system. But in some cases, they might. And I'm, I'm personally still struggling with all that. I'm also sort of wondering, does anybody have any rules about whether you can use the same course in more than one credential? Because we would say you can't use the same course in more than one degree. Can't double count. Uh, I don't think there's an equivalent rule for credentials. So if there's credential A that says take these three courses, credential B that takes, say take this other three, but there's an overlap of one, does anybody have a rule that says the student can't claim two credentials? The other question that comes up is, well, do you, if you have credentials from your own institution, so if your student did a certificate in your own school and then another one and you then stack, stack them, so that's one possible avenue of how one could potentially stack credentials. But the other question is, what if the person gets a credential from school A, a credential from school B, and they now come to you to school three to take these credentials, these badges, and to create one degree out, out of it. So, and is it the same experience that the student would have had had they been a degree-seeking student in a particular program? So there's some discussions in some of our programs as well, particularly also, I mean, there seems to be a different discussion in professional degree programs versus in research-related degree programs. Um, I know that at the national level, at the conference of, um, uh, at, the, at the Council of Graduate Schools, that certainly is also the micro credentials have been a point of discussion there as well, and the the opinions regarding them seem to be quite varied. We have um, a couple that I can recall that are nine hours in length, and 
for both of them, they're at graduate level, um, one course within the three that are required is part of the master's program at that level. And then the two are electives. Um, and so for the credential, the transcripted certificate, it would all be packaged together. Um, and one of, I guess, the outcomes that people were hoping for and has happened is people will take the class or take the program and then just fall in love with it and then pursue the master's degree and, and go on um, with that and then um, one leads to a doctoral and so they can bring in those nine hours towards that program. <clears throat> kind of to facilitate that, I know we've got one program that is microphone. The microphone. Uh, three certificates to be stackable, to so that you could choose any one of the three in any order you want to, and if you wanted to continue, you could take the next certificate. And so that they're specifically designed to be sort of a modular master's degree. So one of the conversations we were having was kind of, uh, James, uh, like, are there any coordinating board restrictions about, you know, students and how much time they can, you know, how many credits they can amass in a non-degree seeking and then later utilize toward, you know, a degree? Are there any? Uh, to, to my recollection, no. There, there are no restrictions on that non-degree seeking category of students. Uh, I, I don't think we single them out in rules as a separate category. So, you know, your, your, main, your main limitation that would apply would be that 99 hour limit that applies to every doctoral program. Uh, that, that's, that's the only pertinent law or rule that I can think of in this situation. On um, the micro-credentialing, a little bit of a different slant on that is the identification of courses that have similar themes. So for example, interprofessional education, it's, a, it's an intensive interprofessional education class. So that um, we're looking at it right now, if they take X amount of hours of interprofessional classes and they'll have a designation on the transcript that they are interprofessionally certified in healthcare. May I ask a quick question about um, the idea of, of certifications or these um, certificates or credentials, depending on which field they're in, how are they separate from the 60 by 30 marketable skills? How are they not intertwined in that, especially um, I mean, I understand this is at the graduate level, but on that 60 by 30, it seems like we're gonna be doing very similar things. And how is this different? Well, that's a good question. I think the micro-credentials are probably gonna be a little more uh, focused on a particular disciplines uh, content and maybe some specific workforce uh, goals, um, but I think I think there's a lot of overlap there because you, what you might find is you might find that this micro credential just kind of formalizes and highlights the fact that the student has mastered the content from this small set of three or four courses with these particular outcomes, and particularly again if the student maybe doesn't doesn't have or isn't seeking the degree, then maybe that's what they wanted in the first place. Um, but I think this is part and parcel of, of the, of the, um, of that discussion of, of how students can be better informed, better understand, and better understand how to market themselves when they come out of programs, whether certificate programs or degree programs, and they have skills and knowledge, and they want to get a job, and how do they convey that? Seems to me that that having these, some, in some cases, having these formal certificates that very explicitly say to employer, oh look, I, student, have been, have been inculcated with this set of knowledge and I have these particular skills. And you can see because I have this certificate that you, hopefully you recognize, you know what that is. 
I think actually that's the critical question. Do employers not want to read transcripts anymore? If they don't want to read transcripts, are we all using the same names for these certificates so that they become meaningful? Or are, are there so many names and so much variety, they're basically meaningless again? Uh, you know, presumably a master's in electrical and computer engineering, Karen and I are both double E's, our employer base has some idea of what that means. You have a credential within that that has some name. If we're not all using about the same name, it's not going to mean anything. Then it's not going to have any value. I think the value becomes the employer doesn't want to look at the actual courses on the transcript, right? But, but that still suggests that the names for the credentials are somewhat standardized and hence have some meaning from one university to another. The other possibility is this is all about people who never want to complete a degree. They've come in as non-degree students. You want to let them get in, take a few courses and leave, and they don't show up as someone who failed to complete their degree. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a number of changes in the ways that employers look at the people they're trying to hire and even look at the whole training regime, right? I, I'm sure you've heard this, but I've heard repeatedly how um, employers don't want to pay for training anymore. They, right? They want, they want their employees, your graduates, to show up ready to work, having all the skills already necessary for them to do their jobs from day one. And they certainly don't want to pay you to, to inculcate those values in. They don't want to pay for corporate training. They want, they, they want the students to show up sort of fully formed, popping out of Athena's head, all ready to go. Um, Reading a transcript, yeah, I, I'd, and to be fair, reading a transcript is a bit of an art, right? That's, that's not easy for someone, especially someone not well versed in academia, to come in and just figure out exactly what skills are on that transcript, which is part of the idea behind the 60 by 30 tax goal. Um, so yeah, it seems like th th that's perhaps part of the arena in which these micro-credentials and these small certificates are playing out, is in an area where employers don't want to have to do a bunch of homework they want something that explicitly tells them, ah, this, is the, this person has the skills that I expect. Um, I, I would like to add to that for just a second. We have quite a few certificates at uh, Commerce. We have 15, I think. Um, and largely, that, that assumption is untested. The idea that the employers are buying into these, we have created these from faculty ideas, largely, thinking this is a good idea, but not really tracking to see if students land certain jobs once they graduate because of these. Um, we have thought out the process pretty carefully. We have procedure related to this. Um, they cannot stack um, certificates to get a degree. They cannot even pull in certificate courses for a degree unless they have approval. Um, so we've done kind of a bit of work, but I think the prevailing thought, from commerce anyway, has been that this is a way to kind of drag students into our master's programs, right? They'll complete the 12 hours, which is predominantly what ours are, and we'll hook them, and they'll then sign up for the master's program. Do you have any information on how successful that hooking is? Uh, short answer is no. And neither do we. And I was just hoping somebody did. Yeah, we have on our campus, we've looked at um, certificates. So when I first arrived there, I looked, and it turns out that a lot of times people who've been accepted as a master's student already have figured out that there is this thing as uh, for the same type of courses, that there also is a certificate. So they want to add the certificate after they've already been accepted as a as a master's student. So they want to retroactively apply for the certificate. And we've had very few students um, actually where the uh, um, certificate led to the degree, except for in certain um, disciplines where the certificate is actually a job credential. So we have a paralegal certificate, and uh, those students quite frequently move on to um, our legal studies master's degree, but that's one of the few. Um, at UTA, uh, the number of standalone certificate programs has diminished over time, and a good reason for that were federal guide rules about 
standalone certificate students' careers needed to be tracked over a certain number of years, um, or we wouldn't be they wouldn't be eligible for financial aid. Okay, part of the deal for financial aid is that they be tracked. We took a look at how many standalone degree programs we had and how many people were participating in them, and the number was small. And so we decided as an institution not to offer financial aid for students in certificate programs that were standalone, which probably accounts for some of the reasons why our number of certificate programs in that area has gone down. Programs that have certificates folded into them as part of the degree requirement, either by creating you know, a body of a pattern of electives that create the basis for claiming they have some sort of specialization, continue to receive uh, uh, financial aid support, and those programs still remain popular. As to whether we have a common terminology that, you know, that we can communicate to um, uh, prospective employers, I think that's important. Okay? But I also would suggest that resumes don't list certificates as the primary evidence that they have a skill. They list specific skills. Okay, that presumably were inculcated by the process of going through the certificate. The certificate in that point of view is then sort of, see, I really did have those skills. And it's just sort of reinforcing the point of view and it's part of an interview discussion about what that really means. So I don't know if it's, for me, it's point critical that we have a cl you know, clarification at this moment on a common nomenclature. But I do think that we have to be very careful in what we tell our students about the prospects of taking their certificate experiences and trying to market themselves on it, uh, about how to communicate what they have acquired through those experiences. Um, and that's, that's one of the emphasis we've put on it. So I mean, short answer is we're not doing many new certificate programs these days. I haven't seen a new certificate program proposal in quite some time, actually. Um, most of them have folded into the degree plan. I think there's one, I think we've talked all around it, and this, this comment made me think of it, but the same situation. We decided as an institution that we would not provide financial aid for standalone certificates because there weren't very many, and it was a bit of a tracking nightmare for, for a lot of people, right? And so we, we just decided we wouldn't do it. Um, Non-degree seekers also are not eligible for financial aid, right? So what happens is faculty members fairly quickly realize that, and they say, well, Student A, if you're interested in the certificate, you need to be sure the graduate school accepts you as a student and you're a degree seeker, you take your 12 hours and move on. And so that's an issue that we've been dealing with and how, you know, I mean, again, we're not, well, we, there's no way to police it, right? We don't deal with that. And so uh, it hurts your completion statistics for their program, which they're putting them in. But um, anyway, that's an issue that, that your two comments made me, made me realize. The only check I know on that is that if the student is accepted into a degree program and tries to take courses for a certificate that don't fall within that degree program curriculum, they're not eligible for financial aid. Right. And that's the only check I know at this point. I was just going to add, I think another use that I guess I've sort of, I think is seen and I guess is one that's being considered, you know, by some of our programs is sort of this about, uh, you know, the micro-credential maybe and the performance, you know, in those courses uh, being utilized as maybe a way to determine whether or not the students then, you know, are at a level to come into the program. And so, yeah, you know, you may have um, uh, the certificate being, say, an online certificate, you know, that allows a program that maybe attracts a lot of international students. And so then, you know, uh, based upon the performance, some of those students could be admitted then into the full, you know, master's program, say, as an example. And I think that's a use, you know, that is sort of uh, happening across the country uh, for those micro credentials. Uh. Yes. Okay. So I guess we will move on then to. Um, uh, sorry.
Okay, so we're going to move to uh, agenda item 14 then. I guess one of our favorite Dr. Cornelius. Good afternoon. My name is Reinhold Cornelius. I'm Assistant Director in uh, Academic Quality and Workforce. And uh, James asked me to give you a brief update about our efforts for the low producing programs. Um, basically, the process changed in 2013 uh, with the statute change, and ever since then, the process of reviewing low producing programs really is using a measurement tool. And that's on the first slide. So it's a, it's a measure of how many graduates a program has over a five year period. And that goes by level. So for undergraduates, 25 graduates in five years. Masters, it's 15 graduates in five years. And uh, for uh, doctoral programs, it's 10 graduates in five years. And so we go through the program list and calculate um, and add up the graduates. And uh, that is the measure. New degree programs uh, are not reviewed for five years. And uh, then since we look at data for over five years, the first time a new program is actually looked at is in its 11th year. And uh, uh, also interesting to you is that if you have a master's program that leads to a doctoral program, um, we don't look at those numbers um, because often that master program serves as a um, step out program for PhD students. And the way that works is actually by zip code. All these programs are, uh, have a zip code. And so the master's program leading to a PhD must have the same zip code. So it's a very uh, um, numerical tool. It's not that tr um, non-trivial to actually calculate that because we have to take into account program changes, zip code changes, consolidations of programs and, and so on, and start dates, and so it becomes uh, uh, a little bit of a, a difficult task, but we do it once every year. And so on this uh, slide, I show you what we do every year. Uh, we produce a spreadsheet for all institution group by systems uh, with the data, and that's posted on our website. If you go to our website, our main website, and say forward slash LPP, you get to the low producing program website. And the, um, there is a link of the spreadsheet uh, with all the data, and it has seven year worth of data because we not only look if a program is LPP, but then we look if a program is LPP, low producing, for three years in a row. So you have five year sliding windows for uh, three years in a row, and that's why we put seven years on this um, spreadsheet. This is posted as a spreadsheet because we know that many institutions or systems want to use it to cut out their own data to plan, because what you can see in this is whether a program is becoming LPP three years in a row in the uh, near future. And so you can go ahead and start the internal discussion about these programs ahead of time. What we also post there is a report the LPP report. This is a PDF, and this report actually goes to our board every April, and it lists all the programs that are LPP three years in a row. And uh, so this document does not have the one year or two year LPP programs on it. And then uh, if uh, uh, per statute, the Corning board at the April meeting 
may recommend consolidation or closure of these programs to the systems, or if an institution doesn't have a system, to the institution's uh, governing board. And when that recommendation is done, the system springs into action to look at these programs and make their own decision what to do with them. So they can either follow the recommendation to close or to consolidate or keep the program if they so wish. If they don't want to close a program, and they may have valid reason for that, they then have to uh, come up with uh, some plan what to do with it or some rationale why this is good. Um, and they need to uh, post that information or post the information that they keep the program on the uh, legislative appropriation request. So the way the process works now of LPP review is that we do the numerical review once a year. We post it in a report once a year. We keep it on the, um, on the website. And in even years, we may make recommendations for closure because that gives them the systems a whole year to work with it, uh, make their own decision together with the institutions, and then in odd years, uh, I got it wrong. In odd years, like next year, 2019, we, we make the recommendation. In even years, uh, you, you prepare the work for the legislative appropriation request, and so, this year, in 2018, institutions were supposed to put this on their LARs. Now, the LAR was due in August sometime, I think, and we looked, and very few institutions actually posted the programs that were still open from this list. So that's why your institutions and your liaisons and so on got a memo a week ago or so that, um, we found that because we also found out that the LBB has a time window of updating your LAR. And so institution, and that's in October. At the time, they didn't know exactly when that happened. Uh, but your institutions can go and add those programs on, in, in a text field in the LAR. And that's really the update. If you have any questions, I, I, I meant to say that we, these posted documents, we periodically uh, keep them up throughout the year. So if your institution closes a program, we take it off the spreadsheet because it's not there or consolidates it. And we also, in the report, we cross it out. We leave it in there for, uh, for, for that year to document it. But if a program is, we cross it out in here so you know and, and uh, people who work with this information know what happened. Thank you. We're faced with a potential low producing program in the future, and so while we've got it on, it's, it's on our topic of discussion on campus. Um, and let me kind of give you an, a rationale for why we want to keep it. Um, it's actually a, um, a reading specialist program and we combined, uh, we offer students a combined degree where they can get principal certification and reading specialist certification. We found that's what the school districts wanted. Well, because of the way the system is set up, we can only give them, we can only credit them for their principal certification in the system we have. We can't give them credit for getting, they're, they're not getting a master's in reading. They're just getting a master's with principal certification. But they're getting the reading specialist certification. So what we've been looking at is, and the numbers might have been like three or two or three graduates last year with reading, reading masters, but we in fact had 15 people pass the reading specialist test. So to disc, to say, you know, it's going to, it's showing up as a low producing program or headed that way, let me put mm -hmm. it that way. So our concern is how do we, this rationale, we could put in the rationale that we're pat, we have them taking the reading specialist test. Yeah, so uh, LPP, as I said at the beginning, is a measure, so the program will be marked LPP because that's just what the data is. Then you can, um, 
provide a rationale and, and especially to your system and say we need this program. And uh, there, there are programs like that where that happens. And then you just put in the LAR, um, a uh, program is needed for the certificate and, and for uh, sc school districts needs or something, a very short rationale you, can, you could add to that in case uh, the, somebody uh, from the legislator reads it and that makes perfect sense and then that is it. Um, so if you look at the report, you will see that um, so we started that in 2013, and since then it has sort of leveled out that there are about 200 programs that are LPP. And about half of them, or a little bit over half, are LPP three years in a row. And this program would be, of course, three years in a row or more. Uh, but that is really not a very big number for the whole state. So I think if, if this project or this review uh, meets its purpose, then that is what we have. You know, we won't drop it to zero, and, but we won't go back to the hundreds and thousands as it once was, because everybody's conscious about it and works on it. So. So just to, I just wanted to clarify something. So consolidation essentially though means that it gets absorbed in another program. Yes, programs that um, are basically different tracks. Uh, we, we see that sometimes uh, where they're very specialized programs. They are all, for example, in agriculture, but they look at different flavors. And if the faculty looks at it and sees that a majority of the courses actually are the same for all these programs, then they can make it one program uh, with one SIP and have different tracks for the students, which uh, tracks are not reported to us, but the SIP code then includes all of it and the program is probably likely not LPP anymore. It does not make sense for every program to consolidate because sometimes a student really needs that decree and that decree name, and so you, you wouldn't do a student a favor to consolidate it with something else. Okay, thank you. Okay, so do we, so we will return to our discussion, well, to our last discussion topic for today, uh, online graduate education. And so I think there's a table that goes with agenda item number 11. I'll just introduce the table a little bit because I helped put it together. Um, on our website, there is, I guess I would call it an interface or a database that um, I'll, I'll include in the summary notes back to you all of how to get to it. Um, but um, staff and um, the Learning Technology Advisory Committee, among others, have been working on um, building up documentation on how many um, online or distance um, graduate programs there are. Um, and so I pulled the data just for 100% um, online, fully online, or hybrid, hybrid blended programs. Um, and that's what these tables are here. And so you'll see the first table is number of program, uh, number of online graduate programs by level and mode. And this includes both universities and health related institutions. And then the second table is count of institutions. So um, like Texas A&M, UT, uh, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, each would count one time. So um, on the second table, that first cell tells you that 37 different institutions are offering at least one program 100% online. So.
Jennifer, yeah. did I in, uh, did I interpret your statement? Uh, the UT system is counted once. No, each campus. So you'd have UT Austin gets one. Okay. UT San Antonio. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, related question from. Gee, I don't remember which table this. Where this. One of our tables earlier was total number of master's programs, doctoral programs, professional type. So, if we look at the numbers on the online, fully online, blended. Can we take the ratio of these to what's in the other table to figure out percentages? Are they counted in some vaguely similar way? Um, you would, so for example, like 100% online or um, hybrid blended, you might have um, a program that's offered in both modalities. So you, you wouldn't want to pull just these tables I provided you, but using the source links that I'll give after the meeting, you would want to go back because that'll give you a bigger data file that includes the CIP, the level, and the program title, and you could um, do some matching that way. Um, we could put we could put something together to do that for proportion, but some some degree programs or CIPs are offered face to face, online, hybrid blended, the variety, and so that CIP would occur once, but would have three or four iterations. Okay, so I, it's complicated. So <laughs> the, other, the other table we have with total number of master's programs mm -hmm. would be CIP straight from CIP. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this number, the 588, for the total of online related masters, m there may be some that only got counted, in some sense, once in that other grand total. On the previous, on the previous table from the previous item, it would be once. Per CIP on um, this one it's CIP per offering so you'll have multiple CIPs occurring on that top table okay, I, th I think I, I just I mean if you just look at these two numbers this is order 1600 the others order 1800 and it would suggest that a third of all our degrees at the master's level are offered online and I was just going to be a little surprised that it would be that high, but if there's some... It's smaller. The <laughs> yes. But it may not be way smaller, so that suggests a pretty large fraction of our master's degrees are, in fact, offered online, at least in some fashion. Mm -hmm. I can go back and look at um, unique values and, and do something with that. Thanks. But a program might also offer a face-to-face -face version and then a variety of these, so. Yeah, that, that's why I was trying to figure out the counting is, it sounds like the 1887 that was on this other table, in some sense, is an undercount, <laughs> or alternatively, the 588 in some crude sense is an overcount. Taking that ratio is not fair, but if you did that, it's a third, and once you exclude the either the double counting or fix the undercounting, that leaves me wondering, is it still gonna turn out to be a good 20%? Which I had no clue that maybe it's that much. Just had no idea. Following up on that, the question would be, how about graduates or participants in these programs? to see how big these programs really are, how, what percentage of the master's pro students are online. Okay, so I guess our, I don't know, if our discussion, if you wanted to say a little more before For we sure. get into Yeah, I, I would say that um, our discussion, this can be an item that carries to the next meeting as well, um, because these additional data points probably would be helpful for furthering the discussion, um, but I know that there were sort of some initial ideas of what it, what is online look like what are emphases where are directions that you're heading um, and then if there's additional information that we can put together um, between now and next meeting um, either just for informational purposes or for continuing this agenda item um, 
I've put down sort of crosswalking unique values and, and looking into other um, descriptive information as well. Um, is there a synchronous, asynchronous angle on this data? <laughs> Right, okay, because when we're talking about capacity, um, when you get into asynchronous offerings, then it, then adds that adds some virtual capacity to the institution as opposed to the other one, and and then you get into faculty workload and all these issues that uh, I was I was uh, curious. Yeah, one issue we've recently um, run into is that um, a program. Uh, made a move to being 100% online, but previously had international students in that program. And so if you have a program that is 100% online where the courses do not have any face-to-face -face component to them, then international students can't come into the country um, and get a visa to take them. And uh, for certain countries, in order to be offered the degree online so that they can take them remotely, you actually have to be registered with their uh, board of, or ministry, board, or whatever it is, of education, so you can actually uh, um, uh, offer the, the degree there. And so that has led to some discussions within some of our programs who had grant plans to make it online, but then they realized that this would have some negative impacts on their international student population. So that's certainly something uh, to consider um, with online degree programs, particularly if you, I mean, if, um, particularly if you are moving from a face-to-face -face program to an online version or from a hybrid version to a full version. So the student must at least be able to take one course per semester that has some actual physical presence on campus. I think it's at least one course, if not two, yeah. That's interesting, because I've, I've heard of some interplay in the opposite direction, that one of the reasons some institutions keep, say, their online master's programs at that 86 to 99 percent level is because the students off, the, the local regional students that live within a certain radius of the institution often clamor for, call for, a certain minimal amount of kind of direct contact. And that, that that in itself then sometimes is a way for the institution to market its program, to distinguish it from all those perhaps more generic 100% fully online programs that have no direct face-to-face -face component at all. So we've actually experienced students clamoring for face-to-face, -face, but what we've found is that they do not actually sign up for the face-to-face -face courses. Um, without a doubt, if you offer a face-to-face -face version at Commerce, you are going to get your online version filled first. Um, a lot of our programs, and we have, we have a fair number online, a lot of our programs um, have moved online completely because we're in the middle of nowhere. Um, and the other part of that is for those uh, international students, they've actually, we've had to actually um, stop admissions for international students into those programs. Now that's not an issue for many of our programs, <clears throat> except for like computer science. And they recently um, went to 100% online, but they are keeping their face-to-face um, as well for the international student population. The question is whether or not that's really going to work out the way we think it's going to work out. Um, because, again, if it's online, they're going to, our students anyway, are going to take it online. Just, just one question. When we say face-to-face, -face, it can be online Skype video face-to-face. -face. We're talking about physical face-to-face. On-site face-to-face. Okay. I don't know if it's working. Oh. Uh, I had a question regarding um, if we explore this data more fully in a future meeting. Um, I would be interested to know if there's any disciplinary patterns in which um, degrees are offered more online, either the fully online or 100% online. Um, and similarly, I'm interested if there's patterns in the faculty um, type that's teaching these courses, either can, if this is accessible data, either contingent or um, tenure, tenure track faculty. Um, I know we definitely can pull discipline um, and CIPs, and we can look in, I don't know about faculty, but we, we'll take a look.
I think it's important that you do try to find out what you can about faculty because my impression, and it's an impression, is that the bulk of uh, the teaching responsibility for our online classes is being carried by contingent faculty. And the teaching load expectations will be different, okay, for a full-time contingent faculty than for, say, a tenure stream. And that gets into questions about, you know, that will be irrelevant to the issue of capacity. Well be exceeding the capacity of tenure stream people who teach heavy online burden, but not so much for faculty whose primary responsibility is to carry the teaching. So I, th I think it's a really important question to ask. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd re really like to see, too, is completion data. If we're going to talk about online graduate education, then we need to have something to talk about in terms of success of online. Uh, didn't see any mention of that. Did I just miss it? It strikes me that's the simplest metric that, we, that you can come up with, which is n-year completions and comparisons between the various modalities of instruction. If you want to get an idea that your programs are successful, that would be a place to start. Not in the higher picture, obviously, but it's a place to start. So then I guess we could open it up for some discussion? You yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I sort of will jump in that our next agenda item kind of talks about some of those other opportunities for information collection with the um, Learning Technology Advisory Committee. Um, so we'll talk about a lot of these um, information collection, um, how is this impacting um, faculty experience um, through that Learning Technology Advisory Committee? Some of that has already been occurring over the past few years, and so there's plans this year for um, collaboration between both um, committees. We'll get there when we get to that item. Um, so we'll go back to discussion um, on online education, what it looks like, and, and things that are occurring. Okay, so I will open it up. I don't know, Kat, do you look like you know? Okay. So I know one of the areas that we have been focusing on is um, kind of related to, you know, I guess the, you know, so Saxon, they're talking about that, you know, the experience for uh, online students needs to be the same as the experience for face-to-face -face students. And so we kind of went through and had to look at every experience and determine, you know, then do we have something that provides, you know, sort of a similar, um, uh, at least amount of information or things like that. So as an example, you know, orientation. So what does it look like then to do the orientation for the online students so that they're getting, you know, the same information as face-to-face -face students? Um, so. I, I've got a more of a question for what people who are doing online. I don't know that it's exactly a THECV issue, but disciplinary processes. Um, at least at UT Austin, if in a face-to-face -face class there's an accusation of academic dishonesty, it goes to the dean of students, there's a fairly well-defined process, it's pretty time-consuming, it's very resource-intensive, and certainly a number of the online programs that I run across proposals for, the whole point is to handle large numbers. And I was curious if anybody's got an experience where they tried to set up a separate scholastic dishonesty process or whether they're running it through the same one they do for everybody else. I'll, I'll respond. I teach online all the time. All of my classes are online. And what I deal with all the time is assessment. And whether or not the response from the student is actually a response from that specific student. And so I have group projects, which basically the, the best student in the team will probably do. And unfortunately, because I teach finance, all my students end up with different numbers. And I tell them all up front, you give me numbers that are related to somebody else, I know both of you cheated, okay? 
And I've had two instances where they gave me somebody else's numbers entirely. And then in, yeah, you know, it was, uh, you know, good question then, right? How far do we go with dismissal from the program? It becomes time intensive and labor intensive. And it, um, nerve wracking to say the least. Yeah, anxious, worried, all of that comes down into being just part of what's going on. And you never see these people face to face. You can't call them into your office and have a sit down and discuss things with them. So, yeah, if we can discuss, you know, assessment issues and measures like that, the discipline that you're talking about, Dean, you're, yeah, very, very important. I mean, in our process, it requires the option of a hearing. And for a large online only non resident population, um, my mind kind of reels in terms of how we would handle hearings. Our problem, our, our process is similar. It, require, it has the option, but it begins with a confrontation between the faculty member and the student, where the student has an opportunity to either accept the faculty's decision or to request to be uh, for, heard further. I don't know how you'd run that in a fully online thing except by email. <laughs> I mean, that just doesn't sound like it's doing justice to attention. For that particular part of our process, we do, some of our professors end up doing email, which I agree is not very um, efficient, but a lot of them do Skype meetings or, you know, go Zoom or whatever, and they actually have the conversation with the students that way. If I can follow up on that, the other big problem is not actually plagiarism between each other, but plagiarism off of what's out there on the, on the web. Um, group projects, it's just amazing, the, and individual projects too sometimes, how it's almost verbatim from, I think it's Chegg, C-H-E-G-G, -G, right? Is that what I'm, where you can find just about everything in terms of answers. If, if you have ever done cases, one semester later, all the answers are out there. And even if it's a unique case, so you know it's got to be your own students, it's out there. I have, and so uh, the assessment, the challenges for online education, just huge. So we have a, we have a pretty advanced and, and totally homegrown online education program at undergraduate and graduate level. And we have uh, purposely eschewed any relationship with third party vendors. And on the, to build the integrity part, uh, we've integrated in our LMS, we use Blackboard. Um, and there are all kinds of pro uh, products and plugins that would avoid all the situations you've described uh, that can be integrated uh, pretty easily. If, if you speak with your IT people, and, and they're relatively affordable, uh, and we catch a lot of people that way. Okay, so I have all that, okay? Yeah. The problem is to what extent are you going to be applying and to what extent do you have the dean? It, uh, um, spending their valuable time to back you up, you know, 100%. Also, if you happen to have numbers, if you have the right number, hey, maybe because they just know what they're doing. Okay, so that's difficult in that way. So accounting, finance, specifically IS, information systems, you get the right numbers because you did it right or you get the right numbers because you happen to use check. There's two ways to get there. I, I agree the numbers thing. We had, we've had some cases where uh, we had data falsification and it was, we, we were able to conclude them successfully, but it was extremely, extremely labor intensive. Textually, it hasn't been a problem. And yes, all of our deans uh, whose colleges have these programs have been very good about uh, executing normal student disciplinary policy. And they, they, they do it and we use Skype meetings and email exchanges and, and group meetings and the whole nine yards and just, we just treat them like they're students. Are you seeing something unique about this problem beyond the fact of the medium of delivery? I mean, it sounds to me like you're dealing with exactly the same problem we deal with all the time and face to face, except the person's rem at remote. And we, we, our, our local research indicated that we actually had more cheating in the classroom than we do online. Huh. Disturbing. 
I know for our online, uh, we, so a lot of our business programs are online, and they use ProctorU for the exams. I can't talk about what they do for assignments, but they do have ProctorU, um, and we just had to recently send SACS uh, documentation from our website that we tell students up front. Um, you have the option of coming to class, coming to campus to taking take your exams um, in a classroom that would be proctored usually by the faculty member or they can pay a certain fee to have proctor you um, proctor their exams if they don't want to come to campus. Any other discussion? I know I see things like platforms and I know kind of what comes up there is sort of what kind of flexibility do you give you know do you allow your programs to use different platforms or does the university have one platform and all of your programs must you know utilize that so I know I'll start I guess I guess for us currently we don't have one platform and I think we see as programs, if we get the number of programs to grow, then we have different ones. And, you know, I mean, one problematic example is students then are somehow, you know, taking courses and they end up having to use more than one platform. And so then that's frustrating for the students. So we, we have one platform, and we've also worked in the graduate curriculum to standardize the appearance of the courses and the mechanisms of the courses. So we've built a kind of template so everybody who enters a course in the, in, in the graduate school, the way it's navigated, its physical appearance, where the information is, is, is replicated. So students, either within a program or across programs, we save time and trouble with that, having to relearn the interface. Yeah. Um, we used to have D2L and Blackboard. But what we've done is we've went purely to Blackboard and standardized it like you had done. It's just, just more efficient that way. Students know what they can see, what to expect, and our tech department can work with one platform all the time. It just is more efficient that way. Okay, well, I feel like maybe people are getting a little burned out and just discussing, right? <laughs> right, so then if there's no objection, we'll just go to agenda item number 12, and I guess we could always revisit some of these topics if people would like to in another meeting. So, um, the Learning Technology Advisory Committee um, and GIEC have been, we've been talking over the last couple of years about what does graduate lo education look like online, the different modalities. And so um, the first thing that's going to happen this year is that we're going to um, set up a meeting with the um, chair and vice chairs um, and coordinating board staff of each of the groups. Um, oh yeah, that's coming. <laughs> um, uh, to talk about how the two committees can work on similar items or discussion topics and share information. Um, in the past, they had convened a joint meeting with um, everybody from both groups, um, but we're gonna first start with um, something smaller, um, and then it'll probably be a tele teleconference meeting. <laughs> um, and then um, move some of those items forward so some of these data points or information points and topics can help um, fuel that dialogue and so the plan is to schedule that over the, the next few months hopefully before both of the committees convene their full groups um, so that we can have something to share back um, and discuss with each of the full groups and then sort of move from there as the topics develop um, or if there's any actionable items to bring forward or to, to work on and develop. Um, so we just want to let you know that last year we had talked about doing it, this year we're going to do it um, and we'll have 
more information, um, hopefully at our next meeting um, in, in the winter. Okay, um, nothing to add, James? No, okay. All right, so then I guess we are um, on to discussing future agenda items. Oh, no. So I have one comment about the LPP um, presentation that was made. On the fourth slide that says the recommendations and actions, I just want to clarify that only the system offices will report um, the, their institutions' uh, programs that are going to be retained on the LAR. So the institutions don't have to report separately on their own LARs unless they're not in a system. Does that make sense? Okay. I'd just gotten a comment that I, I needed that clarified. <laughs> So I, I have uh, an agenda item uh, that, that has come up recently. Dr. Silverman and I were discussing it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, John and I uh, had discussed it recently in relation to one of his uh, programs. And this, this is the issue uh, of uh, doctoral programs. And you know, a while back when I was going to grad school, most of the time for most disciplines, you got your bachelor's, and then you got your master's, and then you applied to a doctoral program. But increasingly, these days, uh, in a variety of disciplines, we're allowing students to enter with a bachelor's as well as a master's. And that opens up a thorny issue for us here at the Coordinating Board, which is the limitations of our rather antiquated program inventory programming system. Uh, due to technical limitations, because it is such an old system, we can't display multiple values for a single program. And, and I totally understand why you want to do it. It makes sense. I wish that the system would allow me to do that for you. But the truth, the simple fact of the matter is we don't have a way to say, okay, uh, your engineering program, if you enter with a master's degree, requires 60 hours. If you enter with only a bachelor's degree, you're gonna have to do 90 hours. Mm -hmm. We don't have a way to show that. So <clears throat> we would like to ask you, which would be better? Which would be more realistic? Which would be the better signal to students for us to put up, which would be better for you as an institution? Would you prefer that we try to standardize it and say, okay, we're, we're gonna show the number of hours required entering with a master's across the board, or with a bachelor's across the board, or is that not the, is standardization not the solution? What, what is your take on that issue? Would it be better for the, for us to adjust our infrastructure to accommodate the realities that we're dealing with? That's a good question, trying to adjust things on your end, on the institutional end. So we just um, started... No, on your end, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I misinterpreted what you said, I'm sorry. Um, at uh, UTSA, since uh, institutional re uh, research also reports to me with the graduate school, what I did is um, we did a query on all PhD students we have, and we have a column uh, which says without... without uh, master's degree, so we internally keep track of uh, the, the master's degree uh, impact on the graduation. We're also looking into full-time and uh, part-time aspects. For each uh, PhD pr uh, program, basically I put together a green, yellow, red zone in terms of credit hours and years, so whenever we run the query based on those uh, years and, and, and zones, the, the PhD file that I pull uh, has all these colors. So if somebody's in the green, which is which is great, if it's in the yellow, I need to watch. If if you fall into the red, I need to go to the dean and associate dean and basically say, why is the student not making the right progress? So we kind of build a little bit of that infrastructure at UTSA. It's primarily based on the NRAF requirement that we need to hit. So now we need to um, monitor it much closely. We actually admit students with bachelor's degree in their own, ca who intend the PhD in their own category. We call them doctoral bound. And those students admitted into doctoral bound programs, depending on the program, can either opt to skip the masters, okay, or only masters in, pro and, in passing. 
Uh, the, so basically what a student is being admitted to is a doctoral program in terms of their knowledge of what the requirements are that they're going to have to meet at the end of the day. But along the way, depending on program, they either hit the requirements for a master's and get the master's in passing, or at 30 hours they're converted uh, into PhD. Yeah, and that's how, that's how we manage the problem. Um, part of the reason we created the doctoral bound is we found that there were a great many students who were intending PhD who were disturbed when they applied to be informed that they were being admitted as a master's student. Uh, they felt this was not what they wanted, and it took, a gr especially with international students, it took a lot of talking to try to explain to them what the system limitation was. Uh, so r rather than continue those lengthy conversations that weren't always effective, we just created a category which says, yes, you're admitted, you're heading for the doctoral program, and so we just kept the fact that from the state's point of view until they reached the criteria for master's or 30 hours, they were you know, classified as a master's student. So, anyway, that was our solution. So, so that was the point I was trying to get at. There's sufficient variety, and we need to change the infrastructure to accommodate that variety rather than cripple the variety or the creativity in order to maintain the traditional structure that has not allowed us to be flexible and to be creative. Okay, I'm sure we're, so at the next meeting when this is an agenda item, uh, I think perhaps uh, I'll try to bring some possible ideas for ways we could try to accommodate this and present them to you and you could may perhaps look at some alternatives. Any suggestions of agenda items or need to think about it because you're sort of burned out? I still, I still want to go back to graduate program review and the upcoming okay, cycle so we, that we have to set for graduate program mm -hmm. review okay. as That's well as on, um, I get, no, this is for a different discussion. Um, I'm having trouble with the characteristics of doctoral programs at my institution with the new professional programs that I'm having to bring on and, and having them run the data. I'd like to discuss that a little bit more too. Okay, so I, thank you. So I forgot, I probably should have and I had a little prelude that right now on our list for the next meeting is graduate program reviews, um, strategic plan for graduate education. So I think the idea is that it will have been uh, adopted at that point. And I guess we will then talk about the recommendations and the next steps. And then um, semester credit hours. Uh, and yes, yeah, so I guess there's a few different things about the semester credit hours, right? Oh, sorry, that's understand. Then clinical placements for nursing, masters, I guess was a topic. And then I guess meeting three was marketable skills, uh, value and contribution of graduate education, outcomes data, and I don't, I, I think uh, sort of uh, various career pathways for um, doctoral students instead of saying call it ag. yeah okay so those are sort of on the list I should say and so there are others and so one I heard was characteristics of um, doctoral programs particularly of particularly the professional the okay professional characteristics can I can I ask one um, topic I don't know if it's of interest to anybody which I'm trying to educate myself on, um, given the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary nature of programs and innovation on campus, um, what is the um, faculty senate, graduate council, faculty governance kind of bureaucracy on your campus? Uh, what I see personally at UTSA, we have a pretty huge bureaucracy and things are not really moving as fast as we wanted to. So I'm just curious if that's a problem that I'm having or other campuses are operating in a different way. Just I don't know if it's a topic of this kind of meeting or uh, most probably not, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
groups. We do have, you know, the ATGS, which is an opportunity to talk amongst the institutions. Um, and so I'm not sure, yeah. Okay. So maybe that one. ATGS? So that's the Association of Texas Graduate Schools. Oh, okay. And so I guess, though, we just had the meeting for this year <laughs> uh, two weeks ago um, somewhere. Where were we? We were in Baylor. At oh, Baylor. at Baylor, yeah. yeah. So next yeah. year we're. So we will be in North Texas in uh, September all the time. So sort of the third week of September or so. That's fine. Thank you. So. I have one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So see, that explains the bureaucracy. I didn't even know that. So. <laughs> I have one more topic, I've, and it doesn't have to be any time soon. Um, it could be later in a later meeting. but. I'd like to talk about protocols for both the institution and the coordinating board uh, for supporting joint programs. Yeah, like I think there's a, I know one program that we have with UT Austin, UTSA, and a little bit with uh, University, uh, the Houston Health Science Center, UT Houston. Yes, that's translational science, yes. Okay, so if there are no other suggestions, then I'll entertain a motion to join the meeting. Okay, so any opposed? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thank you, folks. Safe travel travels, safe. Travels, yes.